Yes. And they keep saying that he's coming back. 
And he's been gone for a while now. And he don't seem like he's coming back. So when Paul sums up his first letter, he says, don't worry about those that are sleeping. One day you're going to sit up with him because we're going to all be caught up. The other thing he says to them is, don't listen to those scoffers, those people that make fun of you because of that funny kind of belief that you have. Yeah, yeah. That one day this guy that the Romans crucified is coming back and he's going to receive you all. Don't, don't worry about those people that make fun of you because we know that the last day is coming just like a thief and a robber finds out. They won't be ready, but you will. Don't you worry about the things that they say or the way that they might tease you because your belief is strange. Because it's going to be just like a woman giving birth. She has no idea when the baby is coming, but the pressure just happens and the baby comes. How many women have been caught at work and they caught a broke? That's how the Son of Man is going to return. So Paul is saying, guard your heart and don't worry about the people that make fun of you. Paul is speaking to us. And the reason I read you John is that John helps us. Because Paul is telling us to come together, just like your theme says, and help bear one another's burdens. Love one another. You know, it's, we can say it, and we feel good on Sunday morning when we say it. And we can kiss each other. Come on, sister. I love you, sister. Praying for you, sister. And then you don't talk to that sister until you might pass by on Wednesday night. You know she's going through. And you say, hello, sister. I love you, sister. How you doing, sister? And then you see her again Sunday. How you doing? And you keep going. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about when you know your sister going through. You know, just like my sisters and brothers from Mount Calvary know that my family is going through. They sitting here. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about when you her husband got laid off. And you cook that extra pot of red beans and put a little smoke sausage and put some baked chicken on the side. And say, girl, we was just thinking about you. So we're bringing this over. Why? You're not looking down on them. You're doing what the church was designed to do. Because the first socialist program, you know how they criticize our wonderful president for being a socialist? He's biblical. Because the first socialist program was designed by Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has taught us that we are to care one for the other. She don't need food stamps. She just needs new stuff. They don't need the unemployment check. They just need the brethren. Yeah, because see, the brethren in the old church, you know, those of us that are little older, we remember how our parents did it. In the old church, when that man got out of work, the deacons found himself. What yeah, you say, Judge? Says, as we have the opportunity, we gotta do good to all men, yes, but especially those of the household, household of faith. faith. Yep. So what I'm talking to you about right now is doing good to those that are of the household of faith, yes. taking care of our own within yes. the household of faith. Yes. That's what we're called to do yes. when we know that somebody needs to go to MD Anderson and they struggle. Right. The all household right. of faith ought to be there. Yeah. to speak that encouraging word. That's what Paul is telling us we have to do for the 
household of faith. Why do we have to do that? We live in an evil world. Wicked. Why don't you know that we're in an evil world? Every time we turn the television on, yeah. we have three to four killings yeah. in a week. Yeah. Locally and nationally. Yeah. We, we just, we don't even, it's like you hear it and you say, oh yeah, somebody else got shot. Oh, they shot up the movie theater. Oh, they shot up the church. I mean, we don't even shop us anymore. Do you realize how many people we've lost just in a summer in America? It's a wicked world. And we make wicked things normal. You know, I, I, I had to adjust myself. And when I say adjust myself, because I was prayerful that same-sex marriage would not become legal in the United States. And if it did become legal, it would be left up to the states. And I'm being honest with you right now. I knew Louisiana as conservative as it is, that would never happen in here. So I was never going anywhere, and I wasn't going to have to worry, because people show up at the courthouse to get married. Unsaved people, all kinds of people show up at the courthouse. And then the Supreme Court says yes. And I had to sit and pray and decide, because I had said, if the Supreme Court said yes, I ain't doing it. I ain't doing that. You know, and, and I had wonderful believers like y'all backing me up. And God wouldn't give me a peace about not doing a civil union. Because God let me know that what I do is not what this man God does. I'm just a judge. I, I hand down sentences based on unjust laws, and I don't say I ain't doing that. Because what God has placed me, where he's placed me, is an opportunity to witness. And it's not just to witness to y'all. My opportunity to witness comes at that courthouse. It comes at that courthouse when atheist people come to me to get married. And I've never said to them, you know, you don't believe in the Jesus I believe in, so I ain't going to marry you. God has actually given me an opportunity since this happened to witness to somebody that I consider a black backslider that wanted to be married to somebody of the same sex. I performed the ceremony and she followed me outside and she said, I am surprised that you signed my paperwork because I know what you stand for. And I looked at her and I said, my stance has not changed, but my job as a judge continues. I still think sin is sin. I have never refused to represent somebody that I knew when I was a lawyer was a known fornicator. I didn't do that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't stop representing people that were known adulterers. I actually helped them get divorced so they could get out of their sin of the state, right? So who am I to now say that this sin, because it's distasteful to me, is somehow different from all the other sins that I've walked out of the house for the years? Darkness needs a light. And if I'm not going to stand and be God's light in darkness, he don't need me to be the light in here.
was showing me Caitlin Bruce, and I, I don't need to be offensive. I call him Bruce because my sovereign God calls him that. But I, oh, I, that's all I can see, his courage award. I had to go online to watch, and I, I, see, I told you I'm not a sports fan. I had to go online to watch Mr. Devon Steele's talk about the power of God. Mr. Steele's is a defensive player. I ain't gonna get specific. But he's a defensive player for the Cincinnati Bengals. And y'all have probably seen his little daughter, Leah, yeah, on TV yeah, yeah, yeah. Battle of Cancer. Yeah, Mr. Steele yeah. stood on that ESPY Award stage and told his testimony. Yes, he did. And that got cut from my Today Show yeah. the next morning so yeah. I could hear all the groups. But Mr. Steele said, last year when my daughter was diagnosed with cancer, I went to the hospital and I didn't know what to do. So I went to the chapel, Come on now. and I prayed, and I said, God, my daughter is not quite five. She's about to be five. If I could have this cancer, can I please have it? I want my baby to live. And he said, when he went back to his baby room, she woke up, and she started, like, patting on her stomach. And he said, what are you doing, sweetheart? And she said, well, Daddy, this is the cancer coming from me and going to you. That man said all that on the stage. The cancer had spread through her body. Yeah, yeah. And he went back to Cincinnati. He said, my team, the owners were working with me, but I still had a job. Yeah. So I left my baby and I went back to Cincinnati. And I sat at my house feeling bad that I wasn't with my child. Uh -huh. And he said, something told me, give up. Go to the liquor store. Get you some liquor and give it up so you won't feel this pain. Uh -huh. And he said, I thought about it. And then I went, my baby can't drink it and not feel the pain. And I said to my baby, don't you give up. We're going to fight this. So why would I give up? So he said, I called my fiance in the room, and I said, we're going to pray. And he said, I've been praying ever since. And he let us know his daughter is in remission, that God has And that's what I'm telling you, that's why you got work to do. That's why you got work to do. All you social media people, y'all should be getting that clip and sending it out. That's why you got work to do because God still hears and answers prayer. And we, once we strengthen each other, we got work to do outside these doors. We got to go tell a dying world that God still saves. We got to tell a dying world to trust him.
and show them love and compassion. Yes. Yes. Right. To look at sinners and lovingly share God's plan for their life. Because God has a purpose and a plan for everyone. They need to know it. They need to know that God loves them so much, so much, that he created an opportunity for salvation. Now, the only way they're going to know those things, somebody got to help them. And somebody with credibility got to help Now, when I say credibility, I mean that when you leave these walls, mm. okay, That's it. you can't be non-loving right. and coming by. You know, I'm telling you about loving the brother. The other thing is, you got to be good to everybody. You got to show love for everybody, not just the brother. You know, there are some kids that are lost. And I, I, don't know, I don't know nobody's story. So before I say it, I want you to know I'm just praying that God gives me things to say. Because I look across, so I think some of y'all say, wait, what's she talking about my child? So I don't know the child. So, the children who talk to me in court, but I don't know. All right, we've got to be able to show the loss of love of Jesus. There are some people that can cook the red beans or cook the pot of gumbo and help out the members of their church. But Junior, get on your last nerve because he's still smoking that crack. He's still in and out of jail. And in and out of jail, he said, Mama, can I have some? No! Gumbo? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know you all that stuff, right? I'm not telling you to not use tough love. What I'm telling you is don't eliminate love. Don't eliminate love. Because if you love you to come into the knowledge of Christ, he has to see you as loving as well. He has to. He has to know that there's nothing that he or she can do that stops mama's love. It might stop mama money, but it won't stop mama love. It might stop mama saying, you know, because you bring all the people around here, you can't sleep here, but I'm a feed you. It won't stop my love. There's nothing that you can do. Why? Because there was nothing you could do that stopped the sovereign God from loving you. There was nothing that you did that stopped him from loving you. The worst decision you ever made in your life, you the only one that still hadn't forgiven yourself for it. Because the sovereign God has already wiped it out in the blood of the sun. Even though you grab it, you know, because you allow Satan to speak to you in your brain. And Satan tell you, you know how you used to, you know how you used to throw down back in the day. You know, when you standing up there telling all these other people and trying to speak holy words and raise holy hands, you say, get behind me, Satan, because that is covered by the blood. And I'm going to keep doing my assignment. What's your assignment? Your assignment is to tell all people about Jesus. Your assignment is to make disciples. You've been gifted and uniquely qualified to grow the kingdom. You have. Only you have the ability to do the things that you have the ability to do. Nobody else. It's your assignment. Now, when your assignment go undone, if you don't do it, absolutely not. God's kingdom will go forward. But why wouldn't you want to be a part? Why wouldn't you want to do what he wanted you to do? Your hands are uniquely qualified to do it. And I need you working. Why? Because every day in your life, on your job, okay, on your job at Walmart, in Kmart, at the mall, at Dillard's, at Marshall's, all them stores y'all go to at Sam's, everywhere you go, there's an opportunity for witness. Because people need to know because they're hurting. And they need to know that there's a God that cares. And not only a God that cares, you care. They need to know that. They need to know that the reason you can go in the store and be able to pay your bill and not cry or have your check bounce or your card don't run is because the Lord has worked with you in your finances. And the Lord is showing you how to live this life. That the Lord is leading and guiding you every step of the way. And he's willing to do the same thing for them. It's our job. But we got to be credible witnesses. We can't go out at the bar and the club and sit and talk with them and talk the same kind of language and demean our witness and then wonder why they won't follow us to new sunlight. They said we had our new sunlight last night at the club. Right. I got to get up early. I stayed up late with you. Right. It's our job to be credible witnesses and not demean the name of our father and care about all our brothers and not be arrogant like 
day to advance his kingdom. Then I wake up this morning with my mind on him. Because if your mind on him, you're going to be your sister's kingdom. Because he's going to press it on your heart that your sister needs you. And you're going to feel the option and the urging. And you're going to say, I just got to go see about her. Mary, I don't know why Mary's on my heart, but I got to go. Because your mind up. And you're not like that. Yes, I am my sister's keeper. Because you know me by my love. Shut